Hi everyone, welcome to PMP Live. My name is Michelle and I'm a bookseller with the Children and Teens Department. Thank you for joining us today in this newer format. We are so excited to welcome author Trisha Elam Walker and illustrator April Harrison here today to tell us more about their new picture book, Nana Akua Goes to School. It's a sweet and inspiring story about what happens when Zora's grandma visits school for Grandparents Day. Trisha is an award-winning fiction and nonfiction writer, a playwright, a cultural and fashion commentator, and a blogger who has written for NPR, The Washington Post, Essence Magazine, and more. She currently teaches creative writing at Howard University, and she's also working on lots of projects. Before teaching, she practiced law for 16 years. April is an artist from South Carolina. Her work appears nationwide in public and private collections. She likes to paint pictures in acrylics, powders, watercolors, pencils, and collage. Sometimes she even adds treasures that she finds into her paintings, like coins from around the world. In just a moment, they're gonna talk to us. If you have a question for Trisha or April, you can click on Ask a Question at the bottom of your screen and type one there. You can also vote on your favorite questions, and at the end, we'll have time to go over some together. You can also click the green Buy the Book button at any time during or after the event to get your own copy of Nana Akua Goes to School. You can select shipping or curbside pickup. If you are a student joining us today, please check with an adult before buying anything. And don't worry about turning off your webcam or your mic for our event. You can see us, but we cannot see you. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Trisha and April, over to you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Michelle. Thank, Thank you so you. much, um, Politics and Pearls, for having us. Uh, I was here for my first book many moons ago, and it's just a delight to be back. I love this bookstore. And it's especially wonderful to be back with April, the award-winning fine artist and illustrator, um, and the gift to my book, really. Um, so I just, we wanted to talk a little bit about the origins of the book. Mm -hmm. And for me, it starts with my mother. My mother was a children's librarian. She was a voracious reader. <laughs> um, she read everything, but her favorite were children's books. And she read them all the time. She read them as if they were, you know, great novels. She felt like children's book could, books could solve the problems of the world. And we, would, we used to tease her when we were children because she would sit in her special chair reading and she would forget all about us. And it was as if the rest of the world went away. And so sometimes we'd say, mommy, our house could burn down with us in it and you'd just be sitting there reading children's books. But out of that, um, she instilled that love of reading and especially children's books for me. And so I always wanted to write one. So I feel like she's in her heavenly um, reading chair you know, watching us with my father by her side. And I'm thankful for that. A little bit about the story itself. Um, I had the book contract and I didn't know what to write about. And I had several ideas um, that I would send to my agent who was, uh, she wouldn't mince words. She'd say, ah, oh, that's boring or that's depressing or that's been done before. So I was a little discouraged and I was, and I was up against a deadline and I was chanting, I'm a Buddhist. I was chanting one day at a friend's house and he had two African masks. And the African mask, I really feel like as I was chanting, they spoke to me and kind of gave me the story. Because initially I thought it was gonna be a story about a little girl with um, the tribal markings who would be embarrassed or maybe teased. And when I did a little bit of research, I found out that it would probably be an older generation person. So I decided to make it her grandmother. So that's kind of where that the story came from. And I wanted it to be a, so a story about learning about difference and accepting difference. Um, and uh, you know that's, that's the origin of the story. Um, the gift of this book is April Harrison. Um, she was, well, the way that it happened was the editor um, at the publishing house suggested her and sent me her work and I loved it. Some of it I, had, I felt like I had seen before. It was familiar to me. And I just couldn't imagine, I was like, oh my gosh, this is more than I could ever have imagined. And I knew I had to wait to see if April <laughs> wanted to do this because she's on that level where she could decide what project she wants to take or not take. In any case, um, she agreed to do it and I was elated 
and it's been magical. I feel like the characters that were in my head, she breathed life into them. And, and that's what happened here. So I'm going to let April talk a little bit about that journey for her. Thank you, Tricia. Um, I was so elated when your manuscript arrived in my email. It was such a wonderful story. It is such a wonderful story about a little girl named Zora and her grandmother and how her grandmother helped her to help others understand differences. And that was so important. It's just a normal story about a normal grandmother and a normal grandchild. And it brought and it touched my heart. And all the stories that take me there to this, this place here, <laughs> all those things, I, yes, I will always wanna say yes to that type of manuscript. It's a story that we need, especially now. Our differences makes us unique. You know, this would really be a pretty boring place without them. But I'm really thankful, Tricia, very thankful for the story. And I really appreciate the fact that I could bring your images to life. So I'm really happy. Your right. words, life. <laughs> Thank you, April. I just want to add one quick thing that I have actually had a piece of April's work in my home for over 20 years and did not know it was her work until another friend came over and said, isn't that by the woman who's you know illustrating the book? So it was truly meant to be. All right, let's get to it. Let's read Nana Akua. I'm going to read and April's gonna show her beautiful artwork as we go along. Nana Akua goes to school. It's circle time, Zora's favorite time of the day. She scoots to a spot next to Theodore and crisscrosses her legs on the rainbow shaped rug. Ready, set, Mr. Dawson says looking at the children over his glasses. You bet, they respond and quiet right down. Next Monday is a very important day, Mr. Dawson continues. Each of you will bring your grandparents to school so they can share what makes them special. Yay, Grandparents Day, shouts Alejo without raising his hand. My abuelo is the best fisherman in the world and he can explain how to catch the biggest fish. Bisu thrusts both hands up and says, my Mimi is the best dentist in the world. She can bring everyone a toothbrush. All the children chime in, their voices leaping over each other to tell what's best about their grandparents. Inside voices, please, says Mr. Dawson. What do yours do? Theodore whispers to Zora, but Zora, just shrugs. When Zora's papa brings her home from school, Nana Akua, her favorite person in the whole universe, is peeling potatoes for dinner. Although Nana's feet don't even reach the floor, she seems as tall as a giant playground fly. Maybe that's because she's filled to the brim with stories about growing up in West Africa where people carve statues out of wood, trees drip with mangoes, and crayon colored outdoor markets sell everything you can imagine. Nana puts down the peeler and gives Zora one of her big hugs, the kind that wrap around you like a sweater. Grandparents day is next week, she says. Maybe you can help me decide what to talk about. Zora stares down at the floor. Zora's mommy knows about Grandparents Day too. Her smile is bright as a sunbeam. How about if Papa plays the djembe drums while Nana talks to your classmates, she suggests coming over to help Nana. Zora frowns and thinks about the last time she and Nana went to the park. Nana pushed her high to the sky on the swings and Zora was almost flying. But on their way home, a little boy pointed at Nana and Zora heard him say to his mother, that lady looks scary. And the very next day, a server in the little tea house stared so hard at Nana, she forgot to bring them sugar cookies with their tea. This is because Nana Akua looks different. When she was young, her parents followed an old African tradition. 
they put marks on her face to show which tribal family she belongs to and to represent beauty and confidence. Those marks never wash off and never go away. Zora looks at her Nana, holding back tears that wait in the corners of her eyes. Nana Akua puts down her potato, takes Zora's hand and says, my precious girl, why such a sad face? It feels hard to explain, but Zora wants to try. She swallows and takes a deep breath. <sighs> what if someone at school laughs at you or acts mean, she asks quietly. Nana Akua thinks for a moment. I have an idea, she says, and puts Zora's arm through hers. Together, they walk down the hall to Zora's room. Nana points to the bed. How about we bring your favorite quilt to class? These quilt patterns come from another long ago tradition. Even though they're not exactly the same as the marks on my face, they can help explain them. What do you think? Zora traces some of the designs she loves with her fingers. When Nana Akua first made the quilt for Zora, she explained that the patterns were Adinkra symbols of the Akan people of Ghana. These symbols represent more than 50 important qualities like wisdom and creativity. Zora wishes the marks were only on the quilt and not on Nana Akua's face. Still, she says, okay, we can bring it. On Grandparents' Day, Zora wears one of her African dresses sewn by Nana. And Nana Akua looks especially regal in her bright patent kaba with matching skirt and head wrap. There are lots of oohs and ahs when they arrive. The classroom is decorated with a rainbow of balloons that float up to the ceiling. There are large welcome signs made with colored markers. A tall chair is on the rug for the grandparents to sit in when they speak. First is Alejo's abuelo, who passes around photos of the biggest bluefish he ever caught. Next, Bisu's Mimi shows the class a video called Mr. Cavity and the Magic Toothbrush. And then Lester's grandparents who owned a barbershop for many years hold up matching clippers. Anybody need a haircut, they ask laughing. Finally, it's Nana Akua's turn. She sits in the special grandparent chair with Zora next to her. Zora clutches her quilt tightly and her voice shakes when she gives her introduction. This is my Nana Akua and she is from Ghana, a country in West Africa. Nana Akua squeezes Zora's shoulder and starts talking. Hello children. I'm sure you noticed the marks on my face. Has anyone seen anything like them before? No, say all the children. Well, these marks were gifts from my parents who were happy and proud that I was born, she continues. I am likewise proud to wear them. Most Ghanaian parents don't celebrate in this way anymore, but it was once an important tradition. Zora watches her eyes wide as cups as Nana Akua walks slowly around the circle so everyone can see her face up close. It's interesting, she says, that in this country, I often notice people who put tattoos on their body that have special meanings. Yours are way better than tattoos, Theodore says, because they grew up with you. Nana Akua smiles. Why, thank you, young man, she says. And I brought some special makeup so that each of you can have beautiful African symbols on your faces too, the kind that wash off. My expert helper will hold up her quilt, which shows some symbols you can choose from. The other students look at Zora expectantly. She unfolds the quilt with care. Today, I'm going to choose the Bessie Saka symbol. It looks like a flower, and my Nana told me it stands for power and unity. Nana Akua paints the symbol 
onto Zora's cheek in gold, while Zora holds very still. The other children clap when it's all done. Come and choose your favorite symbol, Zora says to them. Alejo, who wants to be a beatboxer, points to the Shebwe Muda symbol because he thinks it looks like a keyboard. Nana Akua tells him it means high quality and excellence. Bisu wants to be a veterinarian and picks the Denchem symbol, which is shaped like a crocodile, one of her favorite animals. It stands for cleverness. Peter and Inez design on the Adwell symbol, which looks like the inside of a sliced apple with two identical halves. Twins like us, Peter says. Nana says the symbol means peace and quiet. Like mommy and daddy say, we never give them, Inez shouts. Nana Akua paints and paints until every child has their own design. The other grandparents choose symbols for themselves too. Zora's face glows as she watches Nana Akua fold up her quilt to go home. And this time, it's Zora who gives her very special, not like anyone else's Nana, one of those big hugs, the kind that wrap around you like a sweater. That's the end of the story. Um, but we would like to take a minute to talk a little bit more about April's wonderful artwork, especially the Adinkra symbols that she created, as well as uh, maybe Nana's face. <laughs> you want to talk, April? Yes. You know, Tricia, I believe we both um, participated in the selection of the Adinkra symbols. Uh, we tried to select the ones that we thought a child would appreciate and could possibly draw on their own. So I tried to um, bring those forward. There are some hidden symbols within the book as well. So I hope you guys take a little time and look through the book and see if you can find some of my hidden symbols. Um, some of my symbols that I really appreciate is the Besasaka symbol right here. It's, it looks like a little flower mm -hmm. and it reminds me of an exotic flower. I think you guys can see that. And I love flowers. So this one really resonates with me. And you will definitely find this symbol throughout the book. Um, the next one is um, the J and Yame. And that's this one up here. And it means faith and a devotion to a supreme being. And this is one of the most popular Adinkra symbols. You will see this one a lot on a lot of things. Um, it's one of the most popular and it's one of their um, strongest beliefs and it matches my belief system. So I believe that's why I really like this one. And my last and most favorite is the Wawa Aba. Here you go, right here. And some of you guys may remember this symbol. Look at it real closely. Um, this symbol was actually in the Marvel movie, The Black Panther. Wow. Yeah. Yes, and you may need to just take a little trip to Wakanda. <laughs> you can find it. And when you do, just email me, or not email me, but just go on social media. Let me know that you found that symbol, okay? Um, uh, Trish, what are some of your favorites? You know, I really uh, have always loved the Sankofa symbol. And it's right here. Right now, it's a depiction of a, a bird looking backwards. Um, it's represented in some other ways, but it's always the idea of a bird looking backwards. And it means um, looking, it means learn from the past to build the future. And it just, that that's so significant to me. And I think it's so important. And it's something I try to do, learning about our past, figure out where I am and where I'm headed. Um, so that's a really important one for me, as well as the Denchem uh, symbol, the crocodile that one of the students picked that means cleverness. I just, I, I like the idea of it. I like what it looks like and I like what it means. Um, I really want April to talk about Nana Akua's face because it's such a wonderful story of how she came to create that. And it, um, she did it in such a way that it. I just knew, yes, that's that's my Nana Akua. That's it. You know, when I created Nana, I wanted to create a warm, lovable, sweet, and precious grandmother. One in which any child would just want to run into that grandmother's arms and know that they were loved. 
And I wanted to show that love through her eyes in this instance, and just the fact that she has such a warm presence. Um, my grandmothers didn't quite resemble Nana Okor, but they had the same warmth that I tried to bring to the character or the image of Nana. What happened is I struggled with her, her likeness. I said, I'm struggling with this. You know, sometimes I would do the face, it was too long and lean. Sometimes it wasn't quite, I don't know, it wasn't good enough, I'll say it that way. But one day I was watching, uh, I was online and I saw Trevor Noah's grandmother. Um. She's from Soweto. And I said, that is <laughs> Nana Okoye. So she is definitely the likeness of his grandmother. And she is such a sweet soul. I don't know if you've seen her online, but kind of Google it. You know, you'll find her. She's such a wonderful person. And she became my Nana Akua. I love it. But if anybody out there knows how to reach Trevor Noah, we got to let him know. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. I think it's time to turn it over back to Michelle for questions and answers. Yay, Michelle. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you both. It's great to hear your story and hear some of your favorite symbols. Um, so yeah, now it's time for questions from the audience. So if you haven't already asked a question, viewers, uh, you still have time to do so. You can type one in when you click on ask a question at the bottom of the page. And you can also vote on your favorite questions and that'll move them to the top of the list. So we're going to go through as many um, as possible before our time ends today. So let me go ahead and uh, pull those up. All right. So our first one is from Heidi. Um, I guess this is a little bit more for you, April, for the artwork. But it says, I'd love to hear more about the art in the book, the patterns, colors, use of textile prints, and the illustrations. Um, so maybe if you want to share a little bit about how maybe you layered it or it came together. Or also, she says, what inspires you? So... <laughs> well, you know, I, I am a fine artist first. I just began my illustration career in 2016. So because that's my background, that's how I approached my illustrations. I tried the other way with the blank piece of white paper and the pencil. It just didn't work for me. I had to go back to what I knew and what's been God inspired. And what I do is every single, single image um, starts as an abstract painting. And I know that sounds weird. You say, what, a bunch of paint on the um, canvas? Yes, mm -hmm. it starts as an abstract and then the images unfold within the paint. And you know, before you say, oh yeah, right. <laughs> Try to think back when you were a child and you would lay on your back and look up into the sky and you would look at the clouds and you would see figures and things approach and appear. Well, it's similar to what the way I approach my art. And that's how all the characters basically basically came to be. You know, I didn't know who they were until they actually showed up. But I do, I use um, any water medium, mostly acrylic. I love collage, I love paper. I absolutely adore paper. Anything that I can glue down, I'm good with. And so that's me, that's my process. And most of my work, and you can find me on my um, website, aprilsonggallery.com. And I think we'll have all that information later, but you can find me and you can go see my original work, my fine art, and you can compare it to the actual um, book work. Cool. Very neat. You, I think on the website, it talks about the found objects and maybe coins or whatnot. Are there textures like that or found objects in Nano? Yes. Yeah. You know, I used to take daily walks and note used okay. to take <laughs> daily walks, but anyway, um, <laughs> and I would find um, old bottle caps, oh. you know, all dirtied up and everything. And I would find those or anything. I would go to a mechanic shop. I'd pick stuff off the floor oh. and um, I said, hey, can I have this? And he said, yeah. And so they always found their way into my work. You know, I love texture. So anything I can do to create texture, I do stenciling, mm -hmm. stamping, um, just anything, salt, um, anything, sugar, you know, just to get that texture I'm looking for. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Need to repurpose and everything. Brave new life. Yes. All right. Let's see. Um, we do have a question from Maria. Um, let's see. Trisha, how did you do the research for um, the symbols? And did you have to change them for the book? 
Uh, so the research, I had to do a lot of research for a lot to know, to make sure we were representing Ghanaian culture correctly. Wow. Uh, thankfully, we had a sort of team of researchers. April did research. I did. Our agent did research. Yeah. I have a friend from Ghana who I bugged, probably drove her crazy. <laughs> um, and and this, But the symbols were something I learned about when my children were small, because my children were in African-centered schools here in the D.C. area. Yeah. And um, in those schools, they talked about their Dinkra symbols often. The Dinkra symbols are, are ancient. They've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. So... But for me, it was new when that was maybe, I don't know, 30, almost 40 years ago when I first started learning about them. So I knew about them and I was just delighted to bring them back into this um, book. But they've been around, they made their way from Africa. They used to be just for royalty and really important people. And they were on funeral robes because Adinkra actually means um, goodbye. And so, but they've, you know, they've made their way now into modern culture. They're in all kinds of things, um, fabrics, they're in metal, they're in jewelry, um, I, they're in carvings. When I was in New Orleans, I found out that some of the buildings have fences around them with a Dinkra symbols um, cut into them. So it's, it's cool. amazing, yeah. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Um, let's see, um, Heidi also has a question, Trisha, um, would you be writing a children's book about Buddhism ever, maybe based on your own practice or experiences? Huh, uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> there are some children's books, the Buddhist children's books um, that I have seen, and I thought, you know, hmm, I might like to do that. So we'll see. Okay. Well, who knows? <laughs> well, anyway, I have a follow-up question to that. Do you, um, Trisha and April, you as well, um, what are some things you're currently working on? Can you sh share a sneak peek of anything, any other projects you've got going on? Or, <laughs> or you, want the you want me to go first? Or you, yeah. go? you go first. Um, I'm presently working on my third book, and it's um, about Shirley Chisholm. And it's called Shirley Chisholm Dared. And it's been a real work in progress because it's nonfiction. So research, research, research. That's all I can say about that one. But it's been a very, I've enjoyed the journey. I've enjoyed the journey of Shirley. I've learned so much about this remarkable woman. Mm -hmm. I didn't know a lot. And so it opened my eyes to who she really was. So I'm really pleased with that. And then I have one other book in the making um, and it's called Broke. But that's a future book. Um, we kind of that one's kind of like like this, but <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> but yeah, and I've done little snippets in other books, and they will be released in September. Some of those projects. Cool. Very cool. I am. Um, it's so funny because just yesterday, I think it was my wonderful editor. Shout out to Ann Schwartz of Schwartz and Wade Books at Random House. Um, asked me, what what do you have? What's coming? Do you have anything new? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This book just came out. <laughs> um, but of course, I have been thinking of some things and messing around with some things and tweaking. I'm not ready to show quite yet, but I am working about it and thinking about it. Um, I definitely want to do some more children's books. I do have a book um, on the back burner with a cousin of mine who's also a, a wonderful artist. And so hopefully that's coming down the pike. That's called Dream Street. I'm finishing up a second novel and I'm working on some plays. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> Ever busy. That's amazing. Okay. Um, let's see. So Carolyn, I know, um, Trisha, you talked about your mom and her love for children's books, but um, Carolyn is curious, did you base uh, Nana Okua on anyone in your life? I guess anyone specific. I know April, you talked about when you created her, Trevor Noah's grandma, but is she kind of a combination or is there anything specific for your inspiration there, Trisha? You know, not really. I mean, I had wonderful grandparents. I had a great childhood. Um, but this was really a story I feel like that just was given to me. It just came into me and through me. And um, I wanted to tell it. And, it, you know, I I had the characters in my head. And as I said, April breathed life into them. So it was almost as if, you know, they were gone for a while. And then when I saw April's creations, I was like, ah, oh, there they are. Here they are. They're in my story now, you know. So yeah, That's wonderful. Um, well, here's a question for you both. Um, I guess for me, do you <laughs> guys have any favorite spreads in the book then of how she's brought these characters to life? I, there's so many yes. remarkable images, but are there any that kind of stand out to you or April that you enjoyed creating? Um, 
you know, even a little bit more than others? Anything really special to you both? Well, you know, I um, this was one of my, one of my favorites. The conversation. Yes, yes. I can see hard. there. That, like, it feels hard to explain. I'm sorry. It is. It, can you see? It's it's that time, and it it put me back into a time when we sat at the dinner table and we talked every single day. We didn't go watch TV. I mean, eat at the um, with the TV, et cetera, et cetera. We literally had to sit there at the table and talk, you know, and to see that little little girl with the, the issue, she had a little issue and her grandmother could feel that there was something wrong. She didn't even have to tell her it was anything wrong. Her grandmother knew her because she could feel her heart. So that's, that was one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people talk about the um, portrait of, let me hold it up, of Nana Akua's face mm -hmm. that, that is just, as April said, it's so warm and her eyes speak to her. Many people have mentioned it to me and I do love it too. Mm -hmm. but one of my favorites is this one of Zora. It's oh, because okay. I've, I've seen that face on my children. <laughs> I've seen that face on other people's children. I've seen that face on myself when I was a child. You know, and um, it's that 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 very sad little face that you know you gotta pay attention to and address. And I just think she just recreated that so vividly. That's real. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh no! Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's see. Going through our questions, um, Amy K wants to know, April, what is um, your favorite painting behind you? I know we're in your studio, I believe. Yes. Do you have for your inspiration board behind you any that <laughs> stand out? Um, you know, this is my inspiration board. Um, all of this work is from different artists, including my grandchildren. Oh. Um, so I display their art along with my art all through my house. Um, they're framed and, you know, there's like a little gallery in here um, because I just love to be inspired by other artists. You know, I don't think it's all about me. Um, I think it's all about all those glorious artists out there. There are so many and they're doing such magnificent work. And so they inspire me. And so whenever I'm inspired, I have this new wall I've created. Thanks to my sister, Jamel. She, we both decided to make a collage wall on things that inspire and uplift us. And so that's what you have behind you. So I wouldn't say I had a favorite back there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little, what, Mod Podge of things. But um, yeah, I, I, I kind of like them all. Okay, that's cool. All right, Amy K. Did want to just check. Um, have you written any other books together? I don't think yet, right? Not yet. Not yet. work, Renata. Okay. Um, Robin Marcus wants to know um, how were you able to present the relationship between grandmother and granddaughter so well? So, I don't know, um, Trisha, if you want to speak to that. Oh, hmm. I, you know, I had. Um, Two wonderful grandmothers. Mm -hmm. My grand one grandmother died early, so I didn't have a lot of time with her. But my my other grandmother, who was around in my life, we just had special adventures we would do together. And one of them, I lived in Boston then, was going to Filene's basement. I don't know if you guys know of that store. Filene's yeah. basement was her place. We did not have a lot of money. She did not have a lot of money, but she knew how to shop. And she taught me how to shop. And that was our special time together when we could also talk about all kinds of things. So, um, you know, I think that that maybe was in my head somewhere. Just that, you know, that love. It's just a different kind of love. You love your parents. Mm -hmm. but there's something, the wisdom and the sometimes there's a little bit more freedom with the grandmother. She would let me buy some things that my mother might not have. True. <laughs> just be our little secret. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Sure. All right, looks like perhaps this is from Angela. Um, what made you decide to write a children's book and why the ages of four through six? So why picture book um, to tell this story? Is there anything in particular drawing you to this age range? Well, you know, as I alluded to earlier, is my mom. Hmm. My mom loved pictures books. As I said, she felt like pictures books could save the world. She really did. And she even would give uh, picture books to grown-ups for gifts, which I now do <laughs> to special people um, because the, the pictures books are there's such a wide range of issues and they're just dealing with all kinds of things. And um, I, they, I value them. I treasure them. And that deeply comes from my mother. And so 
this book is exists because of her and it is for her. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we do have a comment from Cicely. She just wants to say hello, beautiful book, and she thanks you for it. So thank you, Cicely. Um, and then April, we do have, um, we're getting close to time, but we've got one more question. So um, we'll circle back to the artwork. Um, Maria wants to know what makes fine art different from illustration? The biggest difference I find is with fine art, I'm in my own zone. I answer to my own beat, my heart, <laughs> What's ever in here, April in there. I don't have to answer to anyone. I do what I feel. I, um, of course, you'll have your critics at the end, but you know, but creating the art is all about you. When you're doing illustration, it's a team dynamic. That's true. And I do say team, <laughs> team <laughs> dynamic. And so you have a lot of opinions, great opinions. I've learned so much since 2016. I've grown so much as an artist, I feel because of this dynamic, um, because you have so, so many wonderful people with so many ideas and they've been, in, they've been there before, they know what works, they know what doesn't work, and you're arguing back and forth and they're saying, no, no, no. And then finally you come to this level ground. And so that has been my biggest difference. You know, I just want to add a comment about that. This, you know, I think I posted one time that it takes a village to create a children's book. And it really, really does. My agent, shout out to Regina Brooks of Serendipity Lit, was so hands-on. She's April's agent as well. So hands-on. She was the one, she was like a barrier before I could even send stuff to the editor because that she was the one who would be like, mm -mm, no, nope, that's not going anywhere. So she was amazing. And then my editor was also very hands-on. She knew this was my first time doing a children's book. So a lot of times we went line by line with things. I read things out loud over and over. There are a lot of edits, a lot of revisions, a lot of teamwork. And, and then of course, April's work. So yeah, joint effort. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you viewers for those great questions. And thank you, Trisha and April for joining us today. We really enjoyed having you. Um, and thank you viewers for tuning in. We hope you had fun. Um, just want to remind everybody, you can of course click the green button below to get your own copy of Nana Who Goes to School. <laughs> exactly. And you can check out our website for updated event listings and follow our children and teens department on social media under at Kids and Pros. Um, that about finishes up our time today. Uh, Trisha and April, do you have any last thoughts for us or um, or any advice you'd give to those maybe thinking about creating picture books of their own or kids that, you know, want to maybe be writers one day? Do it. Start today. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Just like Nike, just do it. Just do it. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself and never, ever stop. Very cool. Stay right. happy and be safe. Yes. Thank you all for joining us again. Um, viewers, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you again, both. And everyone have a good time reading. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Politics and Pros. Thank you.